Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and my schedule today has been totally out of whack. I just got back from taking my sons to a baseball lesson and throwing to them and letting them hit off the tee and letting them field, and, but today got away from me. I did a conference, uh, not a conference call, but I did, I did a um, video call that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release to you probably next week did a video call with the CEO of Token Tax this morning and it uh, or after my first video and it, and it really threw my day off because I don't usually do those but it is a pre-recorded uh, video where I'm going to show you how Token Tax works uh, or he's going to show you okay I want to start this video out with um, the, the markets for the second day in a row we, uh, we saw the stock market just collapse and things are getting pretty dicey um, and so I just wanted to show you that right out of the gate. The crypto market, I don't have it pulled up, but the crypto market um, is, is kind of, has been down a little bit, but not too crazy. It's just been kind of flat to down. Um, XRP, I believe, is at about 25 cents and something. Okay, from Peter Voss, I got this. And this is Tim Draper. Quits, he, Tim Draper quit stocks for Bitcoin six months ago. Um, he now holds a lot of lot in his portfolio. Speaking on uh, CNBC February 24th, the VC investor and serial Bitcoin proponent revealed that he had significantly added his crypto holdings since last year. Draper, Uber drivers were day trading. It's a lot. It's a lot. A lot. He responded when quizzed about exactly how far his faith in Bitcoin extended. I'm just a believer and I look and I say, hey, this is just better. Long term people move to things that are better. Draper was speaking in his characteristic Bitcoin logo tie as stock markets plummeted worldwide due to concerns over that thing that I can't talk about. Continuing to confirm his exposure to the crisis was limited due to previous concerns that stocks were too frothy. It, ju it just got too frothy. The market got, got too excited and Uber drivers were doing day trading. All the signs were there, he said. Um, da, da, da. So anyway. And I think you're going to see, look, you're, don't be surprised if you start to see a lot of these people hitting the exits on the stock market head towards crypto. I'm just throwing that out there for what it's worth. Now, I wanted to show you this. I'm not going to talk about it because on YouTube, they will strike you if you talk about this. But I wanted to show you this and I want you to read what you're looking at because all of my friends have said, basically, all of my friends that are doctors have basically said this type of things is that this one, right, the regular this, um, has a higher rate than this of this. <laughs> and I know it's crazy that I can't say any of this, but I, I'm, I'm not interested in getting strikes when I know all you can read. Um, okay, um, and now moving on. Now I want you to see this. Remember, we keep talking about R3, and I'm going to keep talking about R3 because R3 is a big, big deal. But before I talk to you about R3, see R3 put out this latest About Us video on themselves and I want you to see it. It says, check out our latest About Us video where you can learn about what we are doing, why we believe the quarter platform, the importance of our ecosystem, and why our employees love to come to work every day. Watch here. Um, but first I wanted to show you, not that, but this. I looked up, I wanted to know what R3 stood for. And this is what I think why they named it R R three is because it's an acronym and the and it means refit, replace, or retire. And I believe and, and you'll I'll put this all together in a minute, but I believe R three is for the for the purpose of replacing the the way the current financial system functions. Okay, now I want you to watch their video that they put out today. Since our founding in 2014, we have always held strong in the belief that together with our thriving network of open source developers, core app builders, end users, strategic partners, and the like, we can transform the way the world does business. So I like working at R3 because it's quite a unique 
uh, intersection between sort of startups and one of these sort of big corporates. Because for many, many years it was emerging tech, it was a frontier, and now we're actually delivering on that promise. It's always buzzing, you come in and uh, you just feel the energy around the place. It opens up my eyes. I would say I have a lot more exposure other than finance uh, industry. Uh, we get to talk to um, big real estate research company, we get to talk to regulators, government sectors, uh, insurance, um, and many, many more. The strong relationship that we have with partners, you know, the activity that we see among startups, building components that help other startups reduce their development time, that's very attractive for companies to join. Our team of blockchain industry experts hail from diverse companies and backgrounds. Because we need a diverse uh, talent pool. Um, we need people who are good at project management. We need people who are good at research. We need people who are good at writing things. Uh, we need salespeople. We need all sorts of different types. And the more diverse we are, the more ideas we bring to the table. And it really doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. You don't know where the winning idea comes from. We are well known, we have a very good reputation, particularly in the public sector, and we have an ever-growing workforce of, of great colleagues. Every day is so challenging. I like to be challenged, and most techies like to be challenged. They need to have lots to do. They want to be solving problems, and they want to be solving customer problems. Today, there are hundreds of apps powered by Corda across a wide range of industries, and we see continued exponential growth. It was built with business in mind, so it has, in its essence, a DNA around business requirements. So the promise of Corda, bringing it back to the essence, was I can create something that I can prove is digitally scarce uh, and be able to send that value across a broad network. Corda didn't just slavishly copy what other blockchain platforms did. It actually said, well, what set of problems do we want to go and solve? And then came up with some different answers. And as an engineer, that appeals to me. A lot of what we talk about in the blockchain world is very technical. And then sometimes we talk about these exciting use cases. But somewhere in between there, there's somebody who's an IT administrator who has to figure out how to operate this thing. And it's a new technology for them. So we're trying to simplify that experience by adding resiliency, but also making the actual operational experience easier. Corda has become a de facto platform in insurance. It has given insurers the ability to really go through a digital transformation and lower their expense ratios down from 25 to 35 percent to something much more reasonable. So it brings the simplicity of centralization to a decentralized system. I think Corda is really exciting because it's such a versatile product. Um, there are so many different industries that I can work in and we're really groundbreaking in, that, in those sectors. So we have all of the components that we need to be successful. We have the people, we have the customers, and we have the technology. We're also constantly re-examining our assumptions, constantly re-examining what the market needs to make sure that what we deliver, not next week, but next year and in the years that follow that, um, is just as cutting edge and is just as relevant to the market and the customers of the future. Because at the end of the day, our customers are making a long-term choice, and so we want to grow the value of Corda for today, but also in the long term. Essentially, we are creating a world where Coda is built to be the foundation for a new future economy. Did you hear that? I want to go back to that because this is the most important thing said in this video. Essentially, we are creating a world where Coda is built to be the foundation for a new future economy. We really are at the forefront of one of the most exciting leading technologies uh, today. So for me, it's watch this space. There's a lot going on and it's an exciting time to be at R3. You better believe it's an exciting time. Don't forget that company, folks, R3. When the history books are written, it's R3, PolySign, Ripple, of course, XRP, and um, who else does I say? DTCC, right? Um, I hope I got the abbreviation right this time. Okay, um, now I want to show you R3's Wikipedia page because if you really want to see, and remember that definition, basically the definition is to replace. That's why I think they called it R3, to replace the current financial system. The guy in, towards the end of the video actually said it. Is that that's what Corda is for, to, to really more or less replace and be the future financial system. Now, if you go down to the history, or not the history, yeah, yeah, the history of, of 
of uh, R3. This is where it, you, it's literally laid out for you, folks. You can see the players that are coming in to form the bank consortium. It's, it's, it's written out. Of course, the consortium started September 15, 2015. Listen to these names, folks. Barclays, B, the, these are the companies that, that started in the consortium. Barclays, BBVA, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Credit Suisse, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Royal Bank of Scotland, and State Street and UBS. On September 29, 2015, an additional 13 companies, Bank of America, these joined Bank of America, BNY Mellon, City, Commerce Bank, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, Mitsubishi, UFJ, Financial Group, Morgan Stanley, National Australia Bank, Royal Bank of Canada, Scandinaviska, I'm not even going to try to say that, Society General, Toronto Dominion Bank, Financial uh, Times reporter, this guy wrote that the new additions are a sign the industry is gathering behind R3 in one potential implementation of distributed ledger technology behind the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. Now, and then it, sh it shows others that join. Uh, the, in two, November, a, an additional five, BNB Paribus, uh, Wells Fargo, ING, all these banks keep joining. Now, here's an interesting part. Um, in, in, um, this, in 2016, November 2016, these withdrew. Goldman Sachs, Santander, Morgan Stanley withdrew, and then J.P. Morgan Chase withdrew as well. Now, what I think this is just me talking, but what I think happened is I think that a lot of these, like the J.P. Morgans and the Goldman Sachs, probably in their Wall Street arrogance, said to themselves, "Hey, we found out what they're doing. We can do this ourselves, and, and we'll hoard all. Them. We'll keep it all for ourselves." I believe that's kind of how this went down. That's why you see, gold, if you remember, Goldman Sachs invested in Circle. Okay, Circle owned Polonix. Well, Circle never has publicly acknowledged XRP, mentioned Ripple, nothing. The Jeremy Allaire that runs Circle, Goldman Sachs owns a portion of Circle. That's one branch of all of this where they don't ever talk about XRP or Ripple. Um, JP Morgan, same thing. They, they talk about their JPM coin. So, so you can kind of see how things kind of separate, separated out. But the core of everything going on is R3. And I think some of those since then have, have set themselves up so, so that they, even they can plug into R3. But, um, you can see, and then down here it talks about how R3 sued Ripple. And then they eventually settled that because SBI, the CEO of SBI Holdings, who owns both parts of uh, a piece of R3 and Ripple got them back to the table to resolve the, the conflict. And ever since then, they've been working together and XRP became the first digital asset on the core to settler. So you can, you can literally see all of the most powerful banks in the world and how they came together on this one platform. So I just wanted to show you that. Now I want to show you something else. Spring is put this out today. Spring is delighted to be a crypto compared digital asset summit partner. Join us on March 10th as at, at Europe's flagship event connecting digital assets and traditional finance professionals. Um, so they're going to this digital asset summit that is sponsored by crypto compare. Well, there's two things I want you to get out of this. The first is that they're talking, they're highlighting crypto compare. I will show you what what the, what it is about crypto compare that jumps out at me in a second but first you need to understand that they are connect it says they're connecting digital assets and tra traditional financial professionals i want to show you some of these um uh, before before i go to the traditional financial prof professionals part i wanted to show you this this is one of the things on the agenda data and transparency building blocks for market market integrity um, which basically means price discovery, folks. Now, remember, remember, before I go to some of the speakers, I want, I want you to remember something. This crypto compare, when I saw that name, and I immediately remembered it from this. This is the Q2 2019 XRP Markets Report. Right down here, it says, Ripple worked with trusted partners to evaluate new sources of legitimate trading volume. After evaluation, Ripple decided Crypto compares top tier CCTT, the exchange is rated AA A and B by its exchange Bit Bitmark, offers a more complete look on the quality, regulatory environment, management, and structure of exchanges that filter out a majority of unverified volumes. So um, what, what you're seeing here is you're beginning to see who Ripple 
trust for price discovery. And at this, at this summit, they're going to have a, an entire thing on, it, it looks like data and price discovery. Why on earth they would have this guy who is a bit anti XRP, anti Ripple, Bitcoin maximalist from the block that hates Ripple and XRP more than anything. I don't know why they've got him there because if you want to talk about transparency, these guys ain't it. But anyway, um, the, the, uh, so, so anyway, I want to go on to the speakers, but I wanted to make that point because remember folks, you do not have accurate price discovery on XRP. You can't because we aren't seeing what's happening at SBI virtual currency. And that is the fact, Jack. I do know what we do know is that this crypto compare is one of the companies that Ripple trusts to start to bring about that. I believe that companies like this are going to be in the future, if they're not already, are going to be working with people like the NASDAQ to bring us real price discovery. Now, let's look at the speakers at this because they're trying to, they're, I've told you from day one of this channel, not some, but all of the traditional financial people will be in this market. They're all coming, not some of them, everyone from the most conservative, Vanguard, Charles Schwab, they're all coming. Okay, so here's some of the speakers that are coming to this meetup to merge digital assets with traditional finance. Well, these, you see BitMEX, Bitfinex, Gemini, these are all the, the crypto people already. Then let's see, London Stock Exchange Group is coming. There's Coinbase, uh, Morgan Stanley, Fidelity Investments, Boris Stugart, which I think is the second largest German stock exchange, IBM, Bitstamp, Ripple. Uh, let's see if we see any more. Uh, the London School of Economics, Chainalysis, Van Eck, they do the funds, remember, Binance, Wisdom Tree, they do mutual funds, ETFs, whatnot. See what, see where this is going, folks? Um, let's see if we, if we recognize any more. Uh, I see OKX, there's another Ripple, Shapeshift, let's see if we see any, Ledger Vault, um, let me see if I see any more of the traditional guys. Most of these are people in blockchain that I'm seeing here. Crypto Compare, Coinbase. Oh, let's see, let's see. BitBank, Bit BitPanda, CoolBitX. Okay, but I think you see enough of what we're talking about. This is all being done, folks. Okay, now I want to show you something, and when I show it to you, I'm going to give you my theory. This is from Chinu Patel at Chinu Patel 29. First, we've got this. We know Peter Schiff is anti-Bitcoin. Bitcoin promoters claim Bitcoin has proven itself to be superior to gold as a safe haven and store of value. This is nonsense. Bitcoin hasn't been around long enough to prove anything other than P.T. Barnum, right? There's a sucker born every minute and many of them own Bitcoin. Now, here's what we need to get to. All right. This was seen, sent to me by Chinu Patel. I want to make a point here. Now, remember, okay, this... Um, Remember, the first thing you need to see here, that's Anthony Pompliano, a total Bitcoin maximalist from Morgan Creek. I met him when I was in Vegas. Nice, nice guy. I like Anthony Pompliano. I just think he could not be more wrong. But I understand his position. He's having to defend where I think they took an early stand on, which is Bitcoin. And it's an undefensible thing because it has too many problems. And he knows it, but he can't back away from it at this point. Now, I want to make a point, though. Remember, Anthony Pompliano has owned traditional financial media. When I say that, I mean CNBC for the last couple of years. He's the only guy that really comes on. All they talk about is Bitcoin. They barely ever bring up XRP or Ripple. And if they do, it's just shoved to the side. Half the time, they'll show on their screen Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then they'll skip XRP and show Litecoin instead on the screen. So there's a there's been an obvious reason for this. I don't know what the, the reason is. Maybe they're just pro Bitcoin and all that or proof of work. Well, I believe we're seeing a shift and I've told you this. I'm starting. I've, I've already started to get rid of some of my Bitcoin and I, I'm, I believe that Ripple has signaled us. I think that they're saying X, it's XRP and Ethereum. That's what I think it is. I think these guys are in a running scared mode at this point. I also believe that Julia Chatterley has has taken the smart approach and she she I think that she understands what Ripple's doing and I think that she doesn't think this whole Bitcoin thing makes any sense whatsoever. I think that she's smart. I think she is on to it and she smelt 
she smells she smells a rat on this whole Bitcoin thing. And I think that she at representing CNN's financial news is is a it has put her stake in the ground. She she interviewed the MoneyGram CEO. She's inter interviewed Brad Goringhouse two times and nothing in this interview. She's actually asking him questions he really can't answer. He gives garbage answers to them about Bitcoin and the climate and these kind of things. I'm going to let you watch it for yourself. Um, but I believe that she is on to it. And I think she knows where, where all this is really going. It's the XRP Ethereum show and it ain't Bitcoin folks. Now watch. I wanna, and I want to warn you, I'm going to turn this all the way up because for some reason, CNN pe keeps posting these videos and the videos are, the volume is turned down as low as it can go on these videos. And it's a glitch on their end. And so I'm, I, and by the way, I responded to this by saying, I like Anthony Pomp Pompliano, but he is an, in an impossible place trying to defend all the obvious problems Bitcoin has. It will never be anything more than a store of value. And that's only because of marketing by Pomp <laughs> and, and people like him. XRP is the one. It's always been the one. Now, listen up. I think Bitcoin has a PR problem. Okay. A sustainability greater in 2020 not green problem agree or disagree completely disagree go on so i think the big thing we have to remember is this is the most secure computing network in the world right so it is going to take electricity or power uh, consumption in order to power that security um, but the beauty of it is the miners this decentralized group of people who are uh, financially incentivized to provide that security through computing power they have to go find the cheapest power sources, right? That's how they make money. It's the, the, there's a spread there for them. And so ultimately what they're gonna do is seek out cheap energy sources, which is renewable energy. And so what we tend to see around the globe is In people seeking that out. Yeah, what, what we just see is we see people looking for the cheapest power, which is renewable power. Uh, thankfully, when it comes to a lot of renewable power sources, there's excess power generation that can't be stored somewhere, right? So that's obviously one of the big problems with the battery issues. And the uncertainty with it, you can't have consistent energy power, whether it's hydro or wind or whatever it is that we're talking about yeah, here, so you can't store solar energy so efficiently either. So I think absolutely. that's part of one of the, the drawbacks here. So one of the things you can't store, and then also on top of that, you get uh, infrequent demand spikes, right? So it's not- Look at her face. She's not buying what he's selling. <laughs> Look at her face. Demand. When it comes to Bitcoin mining, all of a sudden now, if I have a renewable energy source, I don't have to worry about storing all that power because I can just install more machines and I have a persistent demand. At all times, I can always have my machines running, consuming power and securing this blockchain. So what we've seen is this explosion of hash rate uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain, continuing that trend of it being the most secure in the world, but it's using renewable power rather than kind of non-renewables um, that are more expensive to actually produce. But there's two arguments there. There's one that, look, this is the most secure mm -hmm. option that people have out there if they come to understand that, and therefore there is some compensation. There is an energy cost to that, mm -hmm. an inefficiency cost to that in terms mm -hmm. of energy. But you also told me that um, around 70, 75% of the energy being used right now is renewable. Where's that data coming from? Yeah. Because there's fierce criticism when I look around the world. and. China, of course, we know they're not clean. Yeah, so there's a lot of studies that have come out. Uh, you know, I'm the first to admit that each study, everyone can pick and choose what they like out of it, they don't like out of it, etc. The general consensus in those studies is 60 to 80 percent, right? So call it 70, 75 percent, 60 percent, 80 percent, whatever the number is. Uh, it's much more than people think is renewable, right? Um, and on top of that, where we see dollars flowing from the investment community is into these renewable-based solutions, right? So whether it's um, things around hydro, solar, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about using nuclear power plants. They have excess uh, power generation. They can't store it. Well, all of a sudden, if it's actually cheaper and, and cleaner to use, could you start to use the nuclear power? Um, I think there's a lot of options, but uh, the best part about this is there's a financial incentive for miners. I can give him one option, it's to use XRP so you don't have to deal with all this BS he's spewing. <laughs> figure out how to innovate in this space, because if they are the leaders, there is a very, very big payoff at the end of it. Will it ever be less energy intensive? I mean, I've got some comparisons here. It was a report done last year. The comparable carbon footprint of Bitcoin mining is New Zealand's mm -hmm. um, electrical energy use comparable to the power consumption in, in Chile. E-waste generation comparable to Luxembourg nation states in yep. terms of of energy consumption here and, and carbon footprint 
can it improve that? Are you saying it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to, as long as it's renewable energy that's being used? Well, I think it's two things, right? So one is renewable makes that story very different than if it wasn't. It does. Right? And then second is, uh, because it's the most secure computing network in the world, you, again, you expect it to have that high energy consumption, but the hardware is also changing. So what you're seeing is much more energy efficient hardware coming into the market. So whether it's through chip designs or, or other hardware innovations, again, it just takes time to do this, right? There's real engineers working with hardware and, and there's atoms involved and, and you just have to do scientific work to figure this out. Is anybody else just smelling rats everywhere? I mean, this is the, the, that is the biggest bunch of baloney I've ever heard trying to rationalize all the, the energy use of Bitcoin. We've seen over the last 11 years it improve. I don't think that that'll stop. It's just how quickly can they innovate? Your call on Bitcoin is- The look on her face is priceless. 100,000 in 2021. Yeah. At what point does Bitcoin's value become so lucrative that bigger companies, perhaps battery companies look at this and go, hmm, perhaps we can work our way around this and, and yeah. offer our technology. So one of the things I think really comes when it comes to battery technology is uh, everyone knows that whoever can solve the problem of storing power will have a massive market opportunity. Um, and where is power best monetized today? One of those is Bitcoin mining, right? If you look at, um, you know, uh, I'm an investor in a company that one of my business partners runs that essentially takes car tires and turns it into a number of commodities, including power. Well, if you sell that power into the grid, you can sell it for three cents, four cents, maybe five cents if you're really lucky. If you then go and you mine Bitcoin with that same power source, you can generate 25, 30, 35, 40 cents. There's a pretty material increase in the financial performance of your power consumption by mining Bitcoin versus selling into the grid. Even the power companies are selling their power for eight, nine, 10, 12, 13 cents. Mm -hmm. So mining Bitcoin is actually so lucrative compared to these other power consumption models that I think over time, more and more of them will start to move in this direction. We're already seeing some of them start, but I think really when that price rises over the next kind of 18 to 24 months is where you'll start to see some really big companies move into the space. Elon Musk. Look, he's got probably some of the best battery technology in the market. Um, and you know, with Tesla, if all of a sudden those power walls either have slow sales uh, in terms of going to homes or he's able to figure out some kind of industrial uh, model, you know, I, I'm not one to say that. So we have to go solve the power problem if we're pro Bitcoin. You don't have that little issue with XRP. <laughs> That's twice as fast or 50 yeah, times look, faster. You know that he's aware of Bitcoin, right? He's talked about it. He, he thinks that uh, paper money is going away. So he's very aware of kind of how all this is playing out. Um, again, it's probably a distraction for them in the short term. Uh, but at some point, I do think entrepreneurs realize, hey, if these power packs actually work how they're promised, uh, they can store power and I can use it to my advantage to mine Bitcoin. It wouldn't be surprising if somebody tries it. And you're comfortable then. We've talked about the PR situation that I think you have. You don't think you have. Um, I don't have any PR, it's, it's Bitcoin, it's, <laughs> but, but I don't think that Bitcoin is uh, in a bad place either. No, but I do think as the conversation about sustainability yeah. and, and green technology continues, and we're seeing that more and more, even just in the last few months, I do think this is one of the things that will keep coming up, so you're going to have to keep uh, talking about this. But you are comfortable with the store of value argument for Bitcoin here versus utility value and transaction fees, because we did touch on that a little bit in the live show. Yeah, so I think that um, store value is really important. You have to have store value before you can have meat. She's basically saying to this guy, you do realize you're full of crap and that the digital assets like XRP actually have use and you guys are, are falling back on this store of value thing because you know that it can't do anything else. <laughs> And right. ultimately, the store of value comes down to two things, right? One is security. It can't disappear. It can't be hacked, et cetera. Um, and Bitcoin being the most secure computing network in the world is very secure, right? So, so we feel confident there. When it comes to price, what you want to see is over long periods of time, either you're preserving your wealth so the price stays flat or continues to increase. The monetary policy of Bitcoin relies on one thing, supply and demand economics. Artificially capped supply, if demand increases, price will go up, right? In U.S. dollar terms. Which so XRP has to. Out, over the last decade, it's the best performing asset. Over the last 12 months, up 150%. In the last, uh, you know, what, six weeks or so, it's up 30%. So it's continuing to do exactly what it's kind of built to do. Now, there's high volatility on an intraday basis. And so people look and they're like, oh my God, it was up 10%. It's down 6%. You know, and they kind of 
are oil, emotional. Oil's been more volatile actually in the last <laughs> uh, three months, so we'll, we'll give uh, crypto that. Yeah, but, but again, people who put their wealth and have a low time preference in Bitcoin have been rewarded very well with this store of wealth thesis. And so we tend to think that the non-correlation of traditional assets will continue to be a valuable uh, kind of aspect of Bitcoin, uh, especially. Okay, now that you've heard all of that bull, now I want you to hear, this is uh, the final question. If, if you couldn't buy Bitcoin, what would you buy? And she, I think this is the part where she asks him about Ripple and XRP. Now, after this guy just went through giving this long drawn out BS explanation of how, it, you know, the energy thing, how you're gonna solve that just to be able to use this slower, more expensive digital asset Bitcoin. Now, he can go on the flip side and talk bad about Ripple and XRP, or he, uh, Ripple's okay, but XRP, oh no, not XRP. I want to refresh this so we can get it, get it going here. If you yeah. can't, if you couldn't own or buy Bitcoin, what other digital asset would you buy? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, it would probably be digitized traditional assets, right, or tokenized uh, traditional assets. I don't think that traditional assets are necessarily going to go away. What we're going to see is a similar transition from what we saw in what I call like the analog age of security. So stocks used to be physical pieces of paper that we would buy and sell and transact. Wait, so you wouldn't buy XRP or you wouldn't buy nope. TRX? If this lady, I tell you what, she's good. She is good. She knows that he... She knows that is the last thing he wants to talk about because he knows this guy. Look, Pompliano is not a dumb guy. That's the problem here. That's the reason a lot of us give these kind of clips such a hard time is because he's being intellectually dishonest. That's the problem that a lot of us have. Why? No, because I, I ultimately don't think that they have the same value that these other assets have. Right. My the belief store is of value argument. Yeah, my belief is that stocks, what gives them value, right? Again, GDP, revenue, profits, etc. All a the stream things, of income from a company that's doing something or something. Okay, so so far he's telling he's tr he's trying to compare XRP to a company, but he's not holding Bitcoin to the same standard because Bitcoin has nobody running the show and so he thinks therefore it's something different. This is the same argument that Mike Novogratz tries to use. He tries to he tries to uh compare XRP to equity in Ripple. Well, Bitcoin the, the truth of the matter is the only difference is XRP is a more efficient digital asset and they know it and it terrifies them. That's why they hate talking about this so much. Well, listen to the rest of this bull crap. Assets, <laughs> right, et cetera. Creating something. So everything that makes those valuable, that doesn't change. You're just changing the technology form factor of which you will buy that asset. So you won't buy that electronic QCIP anymore. You'll now buy that same stock. It'll just be a digitized or tokenized stock. I actually like those assets. They're not bad assets. And I don't think that Bitcoin competes with those assets. What Bitcoin competes with very specifically are their currencies, right? And those currencies, even if they change their technology form factor, I think the monetary policy is bad. Bitcoin's monetary policy is superior. But all of these other assets that are quote unquote utility tokens, either they're utility in terms of they give you access to something. So they're not really an investment. It's more of I get utility or, or some good or service in exchange. So you're separating. I'll use XRP as an example simply because I've interviewed Brad recently. Yep. You see no connection between what Ripple is trying to achieve with their network and the value of XRP. Yeah. So. so in I think Brad would, would say this, right, is Ripple, the software company, is different than XRP, the token. And I think that part of the problem is that retail investors have believed that by buying XRP, they have exposure to the financial performance of Ripple. That's, that's wrong. And that's not even, not just wrong, that's being dishonest. We do not believe that we have ownership in Ripple, the company. Here's what we believe, and this is for Anthony Pompliano. He probably doesn't listen, but if you want a lesson here in what we believe, here's what I believe. I believe Miguel Valles is the head of markets of XRP, okay? And, and I believe he left the CME group, which is a heavily regulated um, company. He left the, the gold desk. He comes to Ripple and he says that his goal is to make XRP as liquid as a fiat currency, such as the Swiss franc, okay? Now, Anthony... If he does that, okay, and, and with all of Ripple's connections and, and the central bank, the rooms they've been in with central bankers and the deals they've cut and the things they have in the work and the people I've seen them in the room with and the, 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 the offices all over the world, 
and one bank after another signing up, I, my, my common sense led by logic leads me to an obvious conclusion. And that is that he's going to be about, if he's, if he does bad, he's going to be about 70% successful in that. And if he's 70% successful in, in creating as much liquidity that is in the Swiss franc, then Anthony, you're a, about as wrong as you can be. And you, it may be a career breaker for you because XRP is the one. It's always been the one. Now, listen up. Not true. And then it would be a security. And that's uh, part of the argument. <laughs> I, I won't even go there, right? But on top of that, what ends up happening is if Ripple is successful, that does not necessarily mean that XRP ends up being successful, right? And so also that means that XRP could go up in value and Ripple could go out of business, right? Speculators could drive the price, et cetera. So when you get this disjointment between XRP and Ripple uh, or other assets that have a similar mechanism. No, Anthony, the difference is that XRP has a team of well-connected uh, people with Ivy League pedigree that have been working on this since 2011 and have been working on the XRP use case that and they're, they've been working to put a dent in the universe while Bitcoin and whoever Satoshi Nakamoto is, who could be Russia or China, isn't, work, isn't working on anything except it's just there. And there is no, I mean, there's no captain at the helm. This is like the greatest investment opportunity of a lifetime. And you are willingly being ignorant. You're, it's, it's willingful. You're turning your head to the obvious if you're, or you're just not looking at all. I don't think you want what to look. What's happening is I, as a, an investor, actually want to own equity in the software company because there's profits, there's assets, there's all you know, revenues, etc. I don't want to own the asset that may or may not be there in the future. Well, in Bitcoin's case, you might want to go get some equity in China or Russia because you might be sitting on something that those guys want to pull the plug on at any moment. It doesn't have any underlying utility uh, or value driver that I can point to and say, I have confidence that that's going to last. Bitcoin's different because it's backed by the most secure computing network in the world. Final, final question. <laughs> I read an interview with you in 2019 that said 50% of your net wealth is in Bitcoin. <laughs> you probably regret saying that. Uh, and I'll ask you where it is today. Yeah, so uh, I've never sold any Bitcoin. Uh, um, I, I, I don't know what the numbers are today. Uh, I, in fact, I've bought more Bitcoin. Uh, but in, in my whole thought process here is uh, I'm relatively young compared to most people, right? Uh, and the other thing people never ask me is like, well, what do I do with the rest? And yeah. it's either cash or real estate, right? And, and so for the most part, I'm pretty risk averse with uh, half my portfolio. I'm obviously very uh, risky with the other half, kind of a barbell strategy given my age uh, and kind of my risk uh, tolerance level. Um, it actually makes a lot of sense. Right? So you're diversified, even though a significant chunk of your wealth. Of course, and, is and in Bitcoin. if you look right, and um, you know, again, when I talk to kind of tr traditional investors, I say, well, how much of your wealth is in dollar-denominated stocks, for example? Yeah. So when we have a day like yesterday, we had where the stock market draws down, you know, a, a material percentage for the, for the volatility that it's used to. All of a sudden, you may have 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of your wealth that's all in one single asset class, right? I mean, individual companies are different and all yep. that but you're still exposing yourself to a similar risk level in terms of everything is correlated. It's all going to move together. Bitcoin's no different. It just happens to be that I've made a very calculated uh, investment decision and one that I'm willing to be comfortable and, and live with. Well, we can be okay. I want to finish this by, by letting you know where I sta stand on this Bitcoin versus XRP. And all this. He, here's the problem I have with all this is that he could easily get up there and tell the truth and he could say, Yes, look, I think all of these digital assets have a place. I think Bitcoin is can be the store of value. I think that Ethereum can be a smart contract platform. And I think XRP can be a utility token. And they could add all kinds of liquidity through the movement of money and the payment systems and all this. He could do that. He won't, He doesn't do it. Instead, he, he acts like there's no value in XRP. And he does it for one reason and one reason only. These guys are terrified. The one, the day that XRP jumps Bitcoin in, in on coin market cap, and it will happen. But the day that that happens, the game, the gig is up because XRP has the same scarcity as Bitcoin. And it, it, there's only going to be a hundred billion, just like with Bitcoin. There's there's only going to be twenty one million. The Bitcoin price will probably always be a lot higher. But, but you're paying more for the Bitcoin because there's less of them. 
but relative, in other words, 10,000 invested in Bitcoin and 10,000 invested in XRP from a scarcity standpoint, it's the same thing, really. I mean, it really is over time. Um, but, but, but as far as utility, that's Bitcoin doesn't have it. And these guys, I think, view XRP as, as the, the worst jumping Bitcoin. All of a sudden, those same investors would be looking going, wait, well, there's only going to be 100 billion XRP in it. Plus, it's got this utility thing. So they have to bash it. I don't have to bash Bitcoin. I can say, yeah, sure, Bitcoin store value. It's not good for anything else. And then I can say XRP, it's a good store of value. It's faster, cheaper, and more scalable. And it's going to have, they're trying to put a, Britain's trying to put a dent in the universe and move trillions of dollars through it. That's the difference, folks. And I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family that XRP is the one. It's always been the one. It is not Bitcoin. And I'm not saying that Bitcoin won't go up and won't succeed as a store of value, but that will be it. Thank you for listening.